Hey everybody, this is Zach, and I brought on our compliance officer, Cameron Corlew. Today we're talking about contracts, specifically purchase and sale agreement going into 2023. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of files. We've seen a lot of mistakes. So we want to go ahead and create this video to cover the contract basics, because every agent comes from different backgrounds, different companies. Mm -hmm. So let's cover how to properly fill out the purchase sale agreement in Tennessee. Yep, so we start off right here at the very top, buyers. Guys, it's very important you put all buyers in, in, as part of the party into the contract. It's very important. You don't wanna have to go through and amend this later. Amendments don't look good. Amendments are, should only be used when needed. Undersigned seller, and I'm actually gonna show you where you can find this. I see this blank all the time. Please do not leave this blank. This is very imperative. Who is selling the property, right? If you are unsure, the listing agent's not responding to you, go over here to CRS tax data. Right here, here's our office address, name, Fountains at Gateway. Make sure to verify that as well, right? If it's labeled as a trust, an LLC, uh, anything like that, you will want to verify with the listing agent. Please wait for their response. It is very important that that part's filled in. Zach, do you have anything to add about that? Just, um, just honing in on all parties need to be listed on this contract. Who's it actually between? Leaving it blank but somebody signing for it, we don't know. Do they actually... Uh, that one was an LLC. Do they have the right to sign on behalf of that LLC? So who is this contract actually between? Fill it out. Yep. The next part is going to be the address. Guys, what house or what property are we selling? Do not leave this blank. Title companies, lenders, any party involved is going to be very confused. You can always find the property address. Do not look at the mailing address. Look at the property address right up here. It's at the very top. You'll see. List every little thing. On the next part of the contract, you're going to have deed books and page. This part also needs to be filled in. You can find that right here. So the deed book is gonna be the first number, page is gonna be the second number. Please check per municipality. Every municipality is gonna be different. Davidson County uses an instrument number instead of a tax ID. So little nuances like that can throw off the whole contract. So be very vigilant when you are looking at stuff like that. And he's using CRS tax data, which is found through the MLS provider. If you don't have a public record search uh, or you can't find the information, contact the listing agent. Get the information, don't just say it's good enough. That's a quick way to get yourself in trouble or even sued if you're missing parts of the document. Mm -hmm. And then the next spot's gonna be right under and or blank instrument number and further described as. Guys, if you're in Davidson County, that's where the instrument number's gonna go. If you are in most other counties, it's going to be your general parcel ID information. So parcel ID and tax ID, that's this number right here. So you can literally just copy and paste that. So with these next two line items, in particular where it says and or blank instrument number and further described as, these two blanks are basically giving you one additional or two additional spaces to further describe the property over and above just 123 Main Street, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So go ahead, whatever you put here, label what it is. So if you put legal description and then write it out or tax ID number, then list the ID number. You wanna make sure this contract stands alone by itself. You could hand this to a stranger on the street and they understand it. You could hand it to your grandma and she knows what it means. If you just write out a tax number 12.0342, nobody knows what that is. So label what you're putting on here to describe the property. Yep, and then right here is gonna be included. So what is included, all items in here are going to be included. Make sure that if there is a garage attached, detached, that if there's remotes that are being conveyed, please put how many remotes are gonna be in here. Um, if there is no garage, then put NA. I, other items to remain with the property at no additional cost to the buyers. Guys, make sure that if your buyer wants to refrigerate any appliances, each individual appliance is listed out. If you put all kitchen appliances. Again, grandma has never been to the property. So a third party or an attorney looking at this doesn't know what kitchen appliances means. Mm -hmm. So you have to label it. It's also a good practice with this included section, whether you are a listing agent reviewing this offer with your seller or you're writing this offer for your buyer, read out what's actually included. That way, everybody's on the same page. There's been so many stories of sellers that take bathroom mirrors, and those by default are included. So make sure to read this with your client. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and please do not put all items per MLS. I've seen numerous of contracts over the past few weeks come through that's on there. Guys, anybody can go through on the MLS and actually edit the listing. So they can add things, they can take away things, and that's gonna be on you if you wrote all items per MLS, just because it can change. And the reason we have these two blanks is because as real estate agents, we are not licensed attorneys. So we do not have authority to strike through, well, bathroom mirror doesn't count, so strike it out. You use the blanks to override the pre-written text. So here it's saying what over and above these items also stays. Mm -hmm. And then if something up here doesn't stay or something else, you put that here, does not remain. So that's where you put that blank to override the text. Mm -hmm. And if there's things that your buyer does not want, like if there's trash, a junk refrigerator, personal property, anything like that, please include that in the contract. Because if it is not included in the contract and the seller leaves it and the buyer closes, 
it's theirs. Uh, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Now, if you have it read into the contract, you can always work that into the contract. I've seen a lot of good agents on not remain personal item in trash. That way you don't get stuck and with a dispute last minute. Absolutely. And then under that, you're going to see lease items. Please find out if there's lease items in the property. It would be a really bad thing to find out three, four, five days before closing. Hey, by the way, that propane tank that's on the property, my clients don't actually own that. They lease that. And then next thing you know, your buyers don't want to assume that, but it's left blank, nothing's checked and it's in the contract and we've got to close. So now we've got to go back and fix that. So under that, you'll see purchase price. You'll enter in the purchase price. Please make sure that you read and make sure it's the correct purchase price and not, if it's a $300,000 house, it's not 3,000 or 3 million, because that can happen. Commas and periods are very important with purchase price. Absolutely. And then financing contingencies, loan to be attained. I'll let you take this one on that. So right here is how much of a loan you need to take out uh, with a percentage towards the purchase price. For, for example, if I'm putting down 20%, that means I need an 80% loan. So if I wanna make a contingent upon that, I would put 80% because that's how much of a loan I need. If I can't qualify for that, this contract does let you terminate and get your earnest money back as long as it's in good faith. But that's what this financing contingency is for. Um, and when, if we keep going down, so this next section, notice a couple keywords here. It says select the appropriate box, not boxes, box. So what type of loan is the buyer trying to get and make this offer contingent on? The buyer can change loan type right here too. So that's why it's really important as an agent, read this whole contract. Mm -hmm. If you've never re read this offer, don't fill it out. So right here, you can change. If I check conventional, I could change to FHA as long as it doesn't increase the cost to the seller. So there's a lot of caveats with this offer. And another thing, another mistake we see is other cash. Cash is not a loan type. This is saying conventional VA, FHA, rural USDA. Other cash is not a loan. Leave it blank if they're a cash buyer. The loan, and I preface this, the loan, cash is not a loan. Big on that. So here's the loan obligations. This is the timeline for your buyer upon acceptance and binding agreement day. So watch this stuff, like the appraisal, the loan application, things like that. This is time sensitive, right? Right here, if your buyer's gonna be paying cash, this is where you go in and write proof of funds, bank letter, whatever method they're using to show that they do have the money, right? Here's a big one, guys, the appraisal section. Make sure that you are yes. checking the appropriate boxes. Sometimes you'll see a contract come across, buyer's getting a loan, and they waive the uh, appraisal contingency, but the buyer's getting a zero down loan. They're borrowing 100% of the money. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's very rare you'd see somebody borrow 100% and actually have an appraisal gap money. Make sure you are checking the appropriate boxes. Guys, you can really get yourself and your client into a bad situation by not paying attention to that. And they actually closed a loophole for 2023 is people were saying it's contingent upon getting a loan and they're saying not contingent upon appraisal, but they were using a failure to appraise as a basis for loan denial. You can't do that. They've now clearly separated it and said, failure to appraise shall not be used as a basis for loan denial or termination of this agreement. So it's really in the best interest. I know we wanna write competitive offers, but if you need a loan and it has to appraise, it's best to just go ahead and make it contingent upon appraisal. That way you have one more contingency in place. And then I just thought of, if you scroll up to financing contingency real quick. Mm -hmm. So right here, uh, I get this question a lot. Unless otherwise stated in this agreement, buyer represents this loan is not contingent upon the lease or sale of other property. So if the buyer has to buy another property, then you should state a contingency in special steps. Just because you check this and then they can't sell their house and now they're denied, that's not a reason for loan denial. Correct, like if you use a first right of refusal and the seller of the property sends you notification, hey, we've received another offer, you have X amount of time to remove the right of refusal, your buyer really needs to know, do they have to sell that property to buy? Because if they do, then they cannot remove that contingency. If they remove that contingency and the sale of that home dictates them not getting the loan, they're gonna be in default of this contract. Specific performance, you can be sued for. So be very, very vigilant when filling this out. After all of this, we all, all have the closing expenses, seller and buyer. Guys, you really, really need to read what are the seller's closing costs, what are the buyer's closing costs. One big thing I see a lot of people is try to include the title expenses. Labeling title expenses as a closing expense. Title expenses are not a closing expense. It is clearly stated in the contract. What are title expenses, okay? This line needs to be filled in, whether it's buyer pay it, seller pay it, or they split it. It needs to be clearly stated. The most common mistake we see is if you read this verbatim, cost of title search, mortgages policy, owner's policy shall be paid as follow. A lot of agents put each pay their own. That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. It's asking who's paying these three expenses. Not all, of not all of closing costs, just these three title expenses. Who's paying it? So you put seller to pay, buyer to pay, or seller and buyer to split. 
Some wording like that, not each pay their own. These are negotiable items. Mm -hmm. And then next under that, you'll see a spot right here where you can label if the seller's paying the buyer's closing costs, if the buyer's paying the seller's closing costs. If buyer and seller are paying their own closing costs, leave this blank. You don't need any redundancy in contracts. Redundancies right. can make things confusing. You might put in the word or or the, and throwing in one word like that, you throw off the whole contract. I mean, the whole meaning of the contract. So if buyer's paying their closing costs, seller's paying their closing costs, leave this blank. Make this as clear and concise as possible. Don't throw in any extra wording. So if the seller's paying the buyer's closing costs, how would you want that to read? Yeah, I, w I was just, uh, I was thinking in my head when you're stating this, let the attorneys do the work because uh -huh. they've created this contract. We're not the attorneys. So if we're restating, we're almost kind of stepping the boundary of like, we're now could be practicing law. And I've seen the or or and get agents in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Let them, let, they created this form and it's reviewed every single year. Let the attorney language do its thing, not us create its own or redundancy. Mm -hmm. And also, if you are going to have the seller pay the closing costs, please use a percentage of the purchase price and make sure of the purchase price is in there. If you just put 3% towards buyer's closing costs or prepaids, 3% of what? So 3% of the purchase price or a flat number. Do not go in there and write seller to pay buyer's closing costs. Well, how much? How much of their closing costs? It's, we need numbers, okay? Right under here, we're gonna see closing agency for buyer contact information, closing agency for seller in contact information. Guys, please make sure that these are filled in, right? If you can't get a, uh, a message back from the listing agent about who the seller's gonna be closing with, you just put on there the buyer's title company. You can amend the contract later, but do not leave that blank. We need to know who's gonna be closing this deal on the side, right? It's very common culturally in Tennessee that the buyer closes at one title company, the seller closes at another. If both parties are even gonna close at the same title company, relist it back to back. Don't leave one blank because we need to know where we're going for closing. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of falls into the earnest money, trust money as well. Right, because now we're starting to see a lot of title companies hold it. it. You know, One thing that you need to do is label who's gonna be holding it, obviously, and put an address because there's some title companies that have 19 locations. Which location's holding it? Because that's a big deal. If this were to ever get brought to court and you've got, let's say, nine different, nine different locations for a title company, the judge might ask which location is holding it. Yeah. And not only that, they may be franchises. They, not, they may not even be independently owned by the same person, right? So now you've got different owners that are getting caught up in something. Guys, please put the address. It is really, really not that hard to find. Go on Google. You can call them on their website. Many different ways to get that address. And we're starting to get into, you'll notice here on line 155, it's saying within blank days. Yes. We're going to start getting down this rabbit hole of some agents mistakenly put three B-I-Z days, biz days, like a B, I don't know. Or, or bus, bus days. What's a bus day? Um, this can get you into a lot of trouble, and a lot of agents I've heard have said, well, if it falls on a Saturday, I want it to go to Monday. If you know your contract, by default, if a deadline, other than four specific ones, closing date, time limit of offer, possession date, and completion of repairs, if it's on a, ho a holiday or a weekend, it gets pushed to Monday anyways. So again, we're just overstating, we're kind of crossing over into attorney land Contract has that already defined. We don't know what business days. Could be we could be, well, I was gonna say we'd be Walmart, Kroger, Zach and I, we work on Saturdays or Sundays, so those are business days to us. You just never know what it means, so just leave it out of the contract. If or you say business days, but what about business time? Is it five o'clock PM? Is it 11.59 by default in the contract? There's just a lot of bus days, biz days, business days. Just don't do it. Right, one word can throw the entirety of the contract off, and one word, can mean everything if this were to get brought to court. Guys, we need to take this document seriously. This is the document that a judge is going to look over. And if you're the one writing it, you're the one that's gonna be held liable for it. So as we continue, failure to receive earnest money, we get asked this a lot. Zach, what happens if the buyer doesn't turn, let's say we're doing a five day earnest money period where you got five days. What happens if the buyer doesn't turn that earnest money in on the fifth day? So honestly, by day six, the holder of the earnest money, so who should be holding it, usually a title company, it's up to them to then notify the buyer and say, hey, you have not made your deposit. That then starts a fresh 24 hour clock counting down until default basically. Yeah, so guys, ju just know you have that timeline. They cannot just terminate the agreement because you have not turned, there's a process to terminate. So another thing is, is closing and proration. Guys, this, this box under closing, obviously we need to have a date. Date, month, year, right? Make sure that's filled in correctly. But when is the property going to be conveyed? I've seen this left blank multiple times. Do not leave that blank. That is very confusing. When is the property going to convey to the new buyer? When can the buyer move in? Right. That's, that's basically what this is stating. Um, and your closing date is one that is not pushed. 
to the next following day if it's a Saturday, Sunday legal holiday. So make sure, check your calendar, make sure your closing date is a valid day that everybody could close, banks are open, everything's operational. Yep. So, and if they are doing a temporary occupancy, please make sure that's going to be with it. This is prorations, how that works. Greenbelt, most properties on a purchase and sell are not going to fall on a greenbelt unless it's a house on 15 plus acres. So we won't touch on this. If it is in 15, uh, if the house does sit on more than 15 acres or the land does, you need to get with the listing agent to make sure that the seller either has any greenbelt or doesn't have any greenbelt because that can cause issues when it comes time to close, especially with the roll back taxes. So special assessments, love seeing this one, Zach. Saw a new one recently, um, this is not calling anybody out, this is made all with love, just trying to help agents get better, is recently we saw here NA. Now a lot of people think like, that's no big deal, there's no special assessment, it's not in an HOA community, however, there could be a local municipality special assessment nobody knows about. Maybe the city's come around and like, you know what, we need to redo the roads and we need to charge all these owners money. Well, if you put NA, by default the contract, again, letting the attorneys do the work for you, it says prior to closing date shall be paid by the seller. When you put NA, now the seller might be off the hook and now it's undefined. Well, who's gonna pay for that? Things pop up all the time through title searches, the closing process, you're gonna have hurdles. Why add one more by putting NA? Yep. Just leave it blank. Absolutely, guys, this kind of goes over title and conveyance, how that process works. D, please make sure this is filled in. I've seen this blank so many times. Who's the deed of the property going to? Because that's gonna be different. You could have somebody going on the deed and a different buyer. That is a very big thing. So please make sure the deed is filled in. Get with your buyers on that. Who do they want? Lead-based paint, this is a big one. We get asked all the time. It was built in 1978. Let's see, prior, prior, prior to. to. So if it was built in 1978, is 1978 prior to 1978? No. Okay. So anything built 1978 to now and in the future, you do not need a lead-based paint. Guys, make sure you get those buyers to sign that and mark, uh, there's two lines at the bottom for the buyer to mark, whether they make a contingent upon a lead-based paint inspection or waives that. That is a federal form. This is a very serious line right here. And if you get confused, it said lead-based paint disclosure. It's not optional. You do have to fill it out if it was 1977 or older. Mm -hmm. So inspections, this one's gonna be very, very, very important. Guys, this is a time sensitive part right here. So this is something you need to read. What is covered in the inspection? What is not covered in the inspection? We'll take a quick second. So within how many days after the binding agreement, right? You can do a five day, seven day, 10 day, 14 day. I've seen 21 day inspections. You could do a month from inspections. That needs to be filled in even if the buyer, unless the buyer is waiving their inspections and they aren't having an inspection. And again, avoiding biz days. Um, because you're now having two sets of time frames that you have to calculate and you haven't defined biz days. It's just a big legal nightmare. So within these days, you have to make one of three options and it lists them here, but you have to make an option within these, uh, within that time frame. Otherwise you're going to accept it as is. So you either have to A, say I'm going to accept it as is, B, terminate because of some sort of issue with the property, or C is what's called a resolution period. Mm -hmm. So, and then to touch up on here, the inspection shall include each dwelling garage and other permanent structure on the property, excluding if there is something on the property that does not deter your buyer from buying it, you may want to list that. Like if there's a detached garage that the buyer says, you know what, if, if it's bad, I'll just tear it down and rebuild it. You can actually put that into the contract. So if the buyer wants everything to be covered, you need to put none. So that, that way it's clear as day, hey, nothing is excluded from this inspection. This outbuilding, if it's bad and I want out, I can get out. Now, the tricky thing right here, getting into a resolution period. So it's a completely separate thing. You have your inspection period, your resolution period. However, you need to send notice to even start the resolution period. It doesn't start automatically. And notice is not a text. It's not sending a text to the other agent saying, hey, we want these things repaired. It doesn't count. It's gotta be email. I prefer a notification form that, or a repair proposal. You need some sort of written documentation, and it's awesome if your client signed off saying, I want these things repaired. Mm -hmm. You send that over to the listing agent, and that starts your resolution period. You're now out of the inspection period and into the resolution. And also make sure all inspections are completed prior to sending the repair proposal. Once you send that proposal, all inspections are just for informational purposes only. Your buyer cannot request they can, but you're in a really hairy situation and it's just best get all the inspections done. If you need to extend the inspection period, get an amendment with all party signatures. Guys, also, if you are on the listing side of things and you get a repair proposal, this is big. If you wanna counter that repair proposal, don't do it through a text message. Do it through another repair proposal or an email saying, hey, our sellers are willing to do X, Y, and Z, but not A, B, and C, and then see how the buyers proceed. Do not do it in a text message. Please do it in formal writing on a repair proposal or through an email.
So, and then these boxes right here, buyer waives the right to ask for repairs and then waiver of inspections. Be very cognizant over which box you check for your buyer. If they're buying it as is and you accidentally waive the inspection, you just cost the buyer any ability to back out without losing their trust money. So make sure you're paying attention to which box you check. This, uh, I'm gonna jump back up to resolution real quick. This one, two, or three, so this is new for 2023 as well. Basically, they cut out another loophole for agents. They were going beyond the resolution period, going back and forth, and if nothing was ever agreed to, they were saying, yeah, we never agreed to something during the resolution period. Well, now that resolution period is a hard deadline. So again, if it's five days, within those five days, we have to make a choice, one, two, or three. Otherwise, this agreement is going to terminate. Um, this next one right here is if you want to not mess with the resolution period, this is what uh, shorthand is called a pass-fail inspection. Basically, I want to do my inspections. I want to have the inspection period to determine, take it or leave it. A common misconception is you can't ask for repair items. You honestly could as the buyer. It's just the seller's under no obligation to entertain it. There is no resolution period. So you could send it over. You could try, but the seller can just say no because they don't have to work with you in a resolution period. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then final inspection, please make sure that box is filled in. I see it blank sometimes. It's like, what are you doing in your final walkthrough? Right? We need to know. As we go down, there's just some more terminology. Terminology keep going and then we're going to come to the home protection plan guys please make sure one of these boxes is checked we see sometimes these boxes are left blank it, it's one of those things hey are they waiving it or are they getting one we would really like to know and then as we go down we're going to touch on the terminology real quick just so we can show the timeline the deadlines yep. and all of that like you said hey guys everything's going to roll over anyways except for four things yeah, those four things, closing date, date of possession, completion of repair deadline, and offer expiration date. So if a deadline of any kind besides those four things ends on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, it gets pushed to the next day anyways, the next business day. And also with your holidays, it's the actual holiday, not the observed holiday. So New Year's threw a lot of people off because the observed day was Monday the 2nd, or Juneteenth throws a lot of people off. So it's the actual holiday itself. If a deadline falls, falls on that holiday, it gets pushed. Mm -hmm. And it's 11.59 p.m. Yes. So even though it says next business day, it's still 11.59 p.m. It's not 5 p.m., it's 11.59 p.m. Monday. Yep. And then as we go down, guys, this is just more terminology, what happens if this happens. Special stipulations, we see a lot of people write certain things. Guys, we're not attorneys. The more you put in there, the more you look like you're practicing law. Any clauses should be listed if then. So if something happens, then this happens, especially with earnest money. We see a lot of people say, buyer can terminate or seller can terminate. Well, what happens with the earnest money, right? What happens in this? Be very clear and concise and do not put anything that is already listed in this contract. Again, redundancy is not needed, especially here. Yeah, so what we see is a lot of agents, for example, one is under the inspection, they check that pass fail box that says, hey, I have inspection period to take it or leave it. But then they come down here and say, inspection is for pass fail purposes only. That's kind of redundancy. It's also, think back to grandma. Does grandma know what that means? No, it needs to be clear as day what's happening. And then I think even if you type buyer right now, it'll pop up a clause for you. These are actually, this is this just is the template. template. Yeah, so okay. it'll pop up. So we actually have pre-written clauses for all of this stuff. Please, we stress, use them. They are written the way they need to be written. Because we see this offer is contingent upon the buyer selling one, two, three Main Street. Okay, it's contingent, but what if it doesn't sell? Can seller terminate? Can buyer terminate? Who gets the earnest money? There's just that if then statement that's missing. We have the if part, but what's the then part? So really get with your broker if you have questions or need to start filling out special steps. Think of this as like a supplemental insurance policy. It's indemnified. If something happens, then this happens. There has to be an indemnifying clause with that. And this is a this could get you in trouble too because this says if conflicting with any preceding sections shall control. So basically this can override the rest of the contract I've seen in here one time an agent say, buyer loves the house and has no contingencies moving forward. And they had an inspection contingency, an appraisal contingency. I think they just overrode everything yep. with that. When you write this, this, super, or this, this supersedes the contract, guys. And you have to be very careful when using special stipulations. Again, we cannot stress this enough. We are real estate agents. We're realtors. We're not attorneys, guys. If you start trying to get in here and manipulate the contract, get it whatever way you want, and this gets brought to court, we don't know what's going to happen. So to best protect y'all, hey, there's pre-written clauses. Please re, re, uh, please use those pre-written clauses. If you have questions, reach out to one of us. We can help get that written correctly for you. Under this, this is going to be big. The time limit of offer. How often do we see somebody accept a contract after the time limit's expired? Too many times. 
it's been probably five or six contracts this week, and it's Tuesday. Come across. So that that time limit, that time uh, time limit of offer up here. Yeah. Notice it says offer terminates if not countered or accepted by. So that is a hard deadline. This contract basically it, it's dead. As soon as it's over, it's dead. People can sign off on it. That's fine, but it's dead. So you either need a new contract or you need to counter or accept within this time frame. Mm -hmm. It's a hard deadline. It's not optional. So just stick to that. That and here's going to be a big thing where the buyer's signature and seller signatures. Guys, we need date and time for that specific reason. Dot loop timestamp timestamps everything. So with a signature, we have a date and a timestamp. If somebody's using Transaction Desk, Authentisign, or whatever software they use, not every single one of them timestamps. Please make sure we have a date and a timestamp when turning in a contract. Because if not, well, hey, this could have been accepted after the expiration, right? Another big thing is make sure these are checked, okay? If they're accepting the offer, if the seller signs and there's no accept, counter, and reject, do we have contract? What is this, right? Yes. If they counter, we still need their signatures with a mark counter, right? If they reject, mark, reject, sign. We need to know what is the status of this agreement. Is it accepted? Is it countered? What is it? Yep. And then um, one more big misconception is this acknowledgement of receipt right here. So it used to say binding of receipt and that confused agents to no end. Basically, a lot of agents have this myth that they think the agent themselves binds the contract. This contract is between the sellers and the buyers. Realtors are not a part of it. They have no effect that say like, well, I waited two days to check my email and then I signed this. So that's, that's when the binding agreement date is. It's actually the binding agreement date is when all parties have signed off and every party has a copy. That means even if your agent had the copy, that's when it started. Yep. It's not when they check their email or if they hold it up and sign this a couple days later. You cannot hold a contract hostage, guys. There, there's no getting around it. As soon as you've been notified, even if you got notified at 11.58 p.m., that is the day zero. That is day zero of your contract. Next day is day one. Doesn't matter if that acknowledgement of receipt has been signed. This can be signed by a homeless person. It can be signed by anybody. We are not parties to this contract. It's very, very, very important. We know this because our contract is time sensitive, right? So we need to be very vigilant about, hey, when as soon as we've been notified that it's been accepted, we're time clock starts now. Yep. So, so I think that's a good coverage of the purchase and sale agreement. Again, we bring this not to call anybody out. It's all love. It's trying to get agents just better and protected that way you can practice for a long time as a real estate agent and not lose your license because there are attorneys out there that will look for anything to go after you to get your license or to look for damages yeah. so just be careful contact your broker if you have any questions anything else reach out to us if you have any questions about this guys we're always available so yep so we'll see you guys next time have a good one guys